his heart ministry voices the father's heart father's heart ministry good morning good morning friends this is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. Why don't you talk for me, honey? This is where you get your whole Bible back, and if you've been with us, and some of you have been with us since we started Genesis chapter 1 about six years ago, um, we have now come to Revelations 15 after that much time, and it has been an absolute delight Russ taught us early on that the narrative drives the experience and the narrative of the Word of God has just been a blessing to all of us. We get, we get emails and reports all the time of how lives have been changed, that you've never heard the Scripture taught from a prophetic perspective from the front to the end. And uh, so we appreciate all of our listeners. And as you're listening to the broadcast via live streaming... You do me a great favor. The video's new to us, and we're adjusting to that. And as of yet, I haven't asked our employee that would help us with this and helps with other broadcasts to come in this early, uh, 8 o'clock in the morning <laughs> here in Arizona. And so uh, as you're listening through the live stream on social media, uh, any... Uh, observations you can make. Is the sound good? Is it overdriving? Does it cut out? That kind of thing. I appreciate it's that. It's just helpful to us as we perfect what we're doing. Amen. And we are now announcing that after a brief hiatus, we're finishing Revelation on the 30th of April. Mm -hmm. And after a brief hiatus, uh, we're going to take some time off. We're coming back to start the entire Bible over again on video. We mm. haven't forgotten our speaker folks. Did you tell them when we're coming back? And uh, you want to go ahead and do that now? Yeah, I think we should. We'll just go prepare ahead. you that um, we are going to take, because we've been doing this consistently for six years, I think you understand, we're going to take a three-month break from it and um, not just rush right back into it. Uh, Russ has some more very important writing, revelatory writing he needs to do. And we do need some vacation time. And also what we're going to do is our uh, our desire is to put on the 52-week Bible study, one uh, one chapter of that each week, uh, each day, weekday. Mm -hmm. So um, you'll have something to listen to to kind of keep you fresh in the Word. And he's, it's a beautiful Bible study. So our return date is, uh, I believe we just looked at it again, August 5th. We'll, we'll be breaking from May 1st to August 5th. Gives us a 90-day little bit of a break, but we'll still be working and in we it. We may also put in some, uh, we, we had live feeds on the Rise, Rule, and Reign conference right. with Apostle Ricardo Watson. Oh, that would be good. But uh, he didn't leave them up on demand. And so we may be taking some of those. There was the Prevail Conference, the... Um, At least the audios, right? Because well, we, we have the here. video as well. Oh, do we? So uh, I'm just thinking about finding something to... to keep instructing. Keep things moving forward, keep yeah. things alive. Keep it fresh. And uh, let's begin this morning with prayer. I want to remind you that prayer is not begging and pleading. Prayer... Is ruling and reigning. And when you pray in tongues, you are building a citadel around yourself of impenetrable power from on high. Amen. That the enemy cannot breach. Thank you, Father. So, Father, in the name of Jesus. We war. We war, God. We are not passive. We are warring. We are asserting ourselves spiritually in the environment that you have called our jurisdiction. Yes, Lord. We acknowledge, Father, that the enemy has no power that he got legitimately. That's right. And that what was lost in the fall because of sin is restored in Christ because of righteousness. And so we stand. We take our jurisdiction. We cast 
the so dragon to, out to, 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 of that in intermediate the realm of yes, angels in the name that of operates Jesus. concerning us. When we say, We say, God, that you moved upon us as you moved upon Paul and Philippi and brought the city, the leaders of the city came yes. trembling to Paul. To and uh, suddenly who he was in the spirit, he began to take an authority. God, that you'd cause your people to rise up out of passivity, that you cause them to rise up out of that which is just a portrayal of something that is of substance. You did not die for a portrayal. That's right. You did not die for church's performance. That's right. You died that we might rise up into our position, not just to go and be a caricature of the church, but to be the church, to be the ecclesia, to be a people, a people rising up in the earth that the world cannot ignore and the religious realm cannot marginalize. God, that that authority would be visited upon us even as it was in Elijah. Where there needed to come a shift in the nation, he didn't rely on a political action committee. He said, there'll be no rain in this land but by my word. Raise up the prophets, O oh God, yes, oh God, that'll say there'll be no internet except by my word. And I promise you regime change will come. Shift will come. God, to bring this nation to Christ as though in a day. Can a nation be built in a day? Can a nation come? To the foot of the cross is though in a day. You are the God who is able to capture the attention, to rivet the attention of, of the people and cause us, Father God, not to be some passive, cloistered group of people in a current, in a church, according to medieval thinking, but that we'd be the ecclesia of God, that Jesus said he would build a militant church, an armed church, a church not armed with natural uh, armament, but armed by the power of the Spirit. For we declare that we're committed to the maxim, not by might, not by power, but by your Spirit. Oh, God, cause us to be instruments of your might, instruments of your power. Bring together an ecclesia. Cause the tribes to come together, Father. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Lord. We say yes to you, Lord, and we say yes to your word today. We thank you that you're going to reveal secrets today. You're going to reveal truths today that we uh, have not seen before because you're always giving us fresh bread. So we thank you for the fresh manna from heaven today. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Glory. So Revelation chapter 15. The many sevens of Revelation. In this chapter, we see seven angels with seven plagues and seven vials. Now, what do all of these represent? Seven angels Mm -hmm. with seven plagues and seven vials. So as we study these things, we're going to gain an understanding of what that, what God is, would say to us about these things, because it's very interesting. There are 19 sevens in the scripture, Hmm. and the number that this one is absolutely fits. This is the 15th seven set of sevens in Revelation, and it happens to be in Revelation 15. (laughs) Now, I understand that the chapter verse or uh, divisions of the scripture are not canonical. Okay. They're not inspired. But yet, Kitty always says, <laughs> anything that makes you do a double take? Pray to pray interpret. Pray to interpret. Mm-hmm. So as Kitty reads, it's just eight verses. We're going to delve into this and see what God has to say to us. A very personal message. Mm-hmm. We're going to see God taking this and turning the facet of it like a jewel and showing it to us in microcosm as it relates to us personally, and then showing it to us in macrocosm in terms of his the the tableau of his linear purposes through time. Mm -hmm. If you go ahead and read verses 1 through 8 of our chapter. Chapter 15. 
And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the the Lamb. Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord? And glorify thy name, for thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked and I and beheld, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials, full of wrath, the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Okay. So we see the next set of eventualities coming out of chapter 14. At the end of chapter 14, remember, there were two great end gatherings. Uh, One likened to the Son of God puts in a sickle and he reaps the redeemed to their safety. And then another comes forth uh, with the the, uh, judgments of God and reaps those that are not written in the book of life Mm -hmm. to their judgment. So we see one redemptive in-gathering and the latter is an operation of God's judgments. Now, in first one of chapter 15, John sees a new sign in heaven of an angel with the last seven, and it's described as that, the last seven plagues, And these are filled with the wrath of God. So we've seen a succession of sevens. Mm -hmm. And I just want to briefly go over them. And if you get the written version of this, you can study these specific verses. Seven churches. Revelations 1, 4, and 2, 1, and 3, 22. Seven letters. Seven spirits. Mm. Seven golden lampstands seven stars, seven seals, seven horns, seven eyes. You think anything makes you do a double take, pray to interpret anything you see that many times? Stop everything, stop the presses, (laughs) put down your, turn off your cell phone. Yep. (laughs) Seven angels, Mm -hmm. seven trumpets, seven thunders. Mm, Jesus. Uh, Think about it. Yeah. Uh, seven heads and seven crowns. What else? Seven, seven plagues and seven golden bowls <laughs> and seven hills. We haven't got to that part yet. Seven kings, seven last visions, Amen. chapters 20 through 21. So the total number of explicit sevens in Revelation is 19. Almost one for every chapter, not quite. Mm -hmm. And this mention of seven plagues is the 15th seven, which happens to be in the 15th chapter. Now, what is the significance of 15? The Hebrew expression for the number 15 is yod Hey, mm. And its symbolism conveys the thought of, if you study that word, it conveys the thought of coming short of a new direction in God. Mm. Coming short of a new direction in God. Mm. The fact that it shows up in the 15th chapter tells us that, see, the 15th chapter is a container for the 15th Seven. So it's about a season 
of coming short amidst a people that have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Wow. Now, okay. what does it mean to come up short? <clears throat> My wife, a, a very succinct theological expression, puts it this way. <laughs> uh, never stay too long at the dance. Ne That's don't the one stay you're too after. long at the dance. Amen. There are many instances of this <laughs> in Scripture such as John the Baptist, who couldn't make the transition from Old Testament thinking to the New Covenant paradigm in Christ, lost his head, yes, came he up did. short of the new direction. Mm. The apostle, the uh, prophet John, I believe with all my heart, he was destined to sit in the seat that was given to Judas. And Judas fell short, and he was destined to sit, both of them, John and Judas, to sit in the room or in the jurisdiction of the Apostle Paul. Mm -hmm. But Paul said, I was one born out of due season. He wasn't first choice. He wasn't second choice. He was third string. And look what he did. Amen. Judas couldn't let go of the Zionist mentality that he had, resulting in his joining the conspiracy to crucify Christ. Esau. Missed out on God right. because he couldn't adjust his character and personality to the demands of what was really going on in his family life. Mm -hmm. uh, in our own life, Kitty and I have just experienced <laughs> a dear friend whose life has taken a devastating turn after flying out many times for mentoring and to see and to see us, to speak into his mm -hmm. life, overwhelmingly the word to him was that he was to make a significant shift, not to stay too long at the dance mm -hmm. or in the situation that he was in. Mm -hmm. And there was delay and rationalization. And the, per the result was, for this person, catastrophic. What happened? He came up short of a new direction mm -hmm. that God was trying to bring him. What about you? What has God been speaking to you and prompting you to move forward in and you've consistently come up with rationalizations resulting in delay? Let me tell you a story. The first church I pastored, my father had established the church. I took it over shortly after it began. And I love that church. I was pouring my life out into that church and God spoke to me. He said, I want you to go and find a list of churches that you can candidate in that was in my organization in the Assemblies of God. Uh, uh, the, God doesn't appoint them, the congregation appoints them, and we just hope God's involved. <laughs> and uh, so I was invited to go and quote unquote try out for a church in Bunkey, Louisiana, that ultimately became the second church I pastored. I took the invitation when I pulled it out of the mailbox and I ripped it into pieces and I said, I'm not going to Bunky, Louisiana because I loved my people. So here's my rationalization. I loved my people. I had a heart for my people. That day, I know what it is when the Spirit of God lifted from King Saul and went to David because the Spirit of God lifted up off of me and I ministered with no anointing for an entire year. Oh, sad. And what's interesting is the anointing was in the house. It just wasn't upon me mm. because we were raising the dead, casting out devils, healing the sick, emptying isolation wards, pulling people out of wheelchairs. People were getting saved. Uh, the church was growing radically. And I felt like I was a dead man walking. Mm. And all during this time, we lived in a, this church was 15,000 square foot. We dedicated an entire wing to pastoral quarters. So I would be there all hours. I lived there and I would wake up uh, with the foot of my bed and see a demon standing, staring at me in the foot of my bed. I see demons running up and down the mm. hallways and I wasn't the only one seeing them. And then finally, after a year, I considered, okay, I'll go. Well, it doesn't work like that, God mm -hmm. told me. I wound up in Houston, Texas <laughs> for a year where I got offered top job after top job after top job. And every time I would go to take the job, God would say, you don't have permission to do this. And <laughs> I was frustrated beyond all measure. 
And then finally, God opened the door for me to go back to the very church that I had turned down. What yeah. was happening? I missed God's season of new de uh, direction. I came up short. Because of rationale and whatever. All of that. <laughs> Excuses. Esau huh? did this, and then We've when the situation blew up in his face, he sought a place of repentance and he couldn't find it. Right. The children of Israel missed God's timing. <coughs> the first time they were to enter Canaan, uh, they quickly realized that they'd made a mistake. And what happened? They were defeated by their enemies, resulted in a 40-year unnecessary delay that cost every one of them their life except for Caleb and Joshua. That's right. Now, we know a man, Kitty and I, who was always fond of asserting his alleged prophetic authority by declaring, you listen to me. This is all about God's timing. Hmm. But he missed God's timing to deal Himself. with something in his life. Amen. And he is now in prison with a lengthy sentence that he likely will not live to see the end of. That's really sad. I, another example of myself, I missed God's timing when Kitty and I were dating. And I came very close to missing out on having her in my life. This was the most brutal season of mm -hmm. all my days oh, and what it took to break out of that inevitable downward spiral was nothing less than miraculous. Amen. So what is God telling us? What is he telling you? What is he telling you to do? Notice what's happening here. These people that have been left over, they've had all these chances in Scripture to come around, but now some inevitable things are happening. I say to you that the clock is ticking. I say to you, no more excuses. Amen. Stop waiting on more hand-holding. Mm -hmm. Either uh, uh, stay, staying in that familiar territory, staying in that waste-howling wilderness, stay there or move on with God. You don't have 40 years to languish Come in that on. wilderness, and it's up to you. You've been waiting on God to do something, but he gave you the command. Amen. And you know, you know you've missed, or you know you're about to miss the plan of God, and you've got all kinds of rationalizations that take it out of the realm and take it out of your hands. I say to you, act now. Mm -hmm. You cannot let a family member be your excuse. Amen. You cannot let your job be your excuse. You can't let your current commitments and your idea of your obligations be your excuse. Stop listening to the counsel of those who cannot give you what they do not have. True. You may love them, but I say to you by the Spirit, they are do-nothings who have decided there's nothing to do, and they've drawn you in after them mm. by the word of the Lord, allegedly. Mm -mm. You have to move. Amen. And in Jesus' name, I call for the shift in your life right now. Yes. And it begins not with passive waiting, but by taking action right now, today. Mm -hmm. If you let the sun today set on the status quo of your life, you will have missed the opportunity that God has placed in front of you. Amen. Amen. Then John sees a sea of glass mingled with fire. And all of those who have gained victory over the beast, what, what beast? We'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> they join together on this sea of glass mingled with fire, there with the one who sits on the throne. Now, what is the beast? Remember, we can dial back. He was the beast with many names, or dinamis in the Latin, written upon the beast, with a great harlot sitting upon it with the cup of the blood of the martyrs. And we talked about what that meant. That's the church through time. The harlot church of the Middle Ages, the denominational system of our day. True. Have you overcome the beast? Jeez. Would you relinquish your Christianity for Christ? <laughs> Are you listening to me? Amen. And you say, yes, I'm non-denominational. <laughs> you need to understand that of all the denomies on that beast that the harlot sits on with the cup of the blood of the martyrs, if you look on the backside of that beast, that's where all the non-denominational, non-aligned, independent churches mm -hmm. are listed and their names. You have to ask yourself, oh, some would say, well, that, that isn't necessary. 
I don't have to give that up. It's, it's, it's Christian culture. It's, it's the mm. church. Tell that to the first century Jew. You know, Jesus came. He didn't come preaching Christianity. He was the Christ. He came preaching the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God comes with demonstration when you are in the kingdom of God and moving under his anointing, his unction to function by. He came for the kingdom to be expanded. So tell that. Do you have to give it up? Do you have to? I don't have to. My mama went to this church. My daddy went to this church. My family's been in this church has DNA all the way back to Peter. My church was started by the Apostle Peter, <laughs> uh, et cetera, et cetera. My church was built by William Branham. Hello. Tell that to the first century Jew. Talk to the first century Jew about what he had to be willing to walk away from. Mm -hmm. Only the Jew who abandoned Judaism and his religious culture at great personal cost of walking away from that tradition, only that person could have been placed by in that nation that God was building in Christ, the church of the living God in the first century. Are you willing to go out? <laughs> Are you willing to go all the way out? To him, as Hebrews says, outside the camp? Or are you falling short of the new direction? The first century church fell short of the new direction. Well, it's not the first century. Is there any difference in character or tone between the religious system that crucified Jesus and Christianity as we know it today? There is no difference. So I say again, are you willing to go out so that you go so far out, they don't even think you're a good Christian, just like they thought those people were not good Jews. If necessary to go out to him, where is God? He, Jesus is outside the camp. And if that's you and you're ready to make that sacrifice, then let me tell you something. The gilded invitation awaits you at the door of this scene of the sea of glass mingled with fire that you might be numbered among those. And you better hurry because the choir director is calling us to order for we are about to sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Hallelujah. In verse 3, this company sings the song of Moses together with the song of the Lamb, extolling the Lord God Almighty, Amen. whose words are just and true, the King of all saints. Amen. As this, you got to understand, when they made that statement, that was a capital offense. And anybody that believed it, it was a capital offense. People were torn by lions. Mm. They were ripped apart by wild beasts, had their children ripped out of their wombs Jesus. for believing that. Jesus. The king of all saints. <inaudible> the governance of God. Mm -hmm. As this company thunders forth their praise in the, these choral strains never heard before mortal men, as it's happening, all of a sudden, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven is opened. Amen. What is this? It's none other than the Ark of the Covenant, the same language to describe the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant that disappeared in Solomon's day. Where did the Ark of the Covenant go? <laughs> Did it go into a medieval chapel in England or Ireland, no. according to Dan Brown? No way. Did it go into a shrine in Ethiopia surrounded by guards with submachine guns? No. Is it in a hidden chamber in the Temple Mount? Or is it in a cave under the hill of Golgotha? Come on. Next time somebody speculates where the tabernacle of the testimony or the Ark of the Covenant is... Put on your Indiana Jones hat and pull out <laughs> Revelations chapter 15, 5. Glory. I know where it is. It's hidden in God Amen. in Revelations 15, 5. Amen. And you know exactly where it may be found. Indeed. It is hidden in God. It is hidden in Christ in God, <laughs> in the macrocosm, Amen. in that ethereal realm known as the third heaven, in microcosm. It sits open. It's open. Can you feel it opening? Yes, it opening Jesus. in the chamber of your own heart yes. where God sits. Yes, and the Lord. Lamb is seated on the throne of yes, yieldedness God. with you. Yes, Father. Christ within. When the tabernacle of the witness is opened, seven angels come out. 
Ta-da! <laughs> I think of like a vaudeville stage. They come out. Uh, they come out carrying seven plagues. Ouch. When the <laughs> seven angels carrying the seven plagues appear, one of the four living creatures additionally hands them, oh, it's you, seven vials full wow. of the wrath of God. What does this tell us? This tells us vials. Remember the vials of the prayers? Mm -hmm. God keeps your prayers in the same container he keeps his wrath. Mm -hmm. Are you listening? Come on. This tells us that the wrath of God is non-existent, is not non-existent. The mm -hmm. wrath of God is not non-existent. Right. It has been held in the heavens for an appointed time after the reaping of the redeemed to their place of safety in God's throne. Amen. When the seven angels with the seven plagues receive the seven vials, the temple of God is filled with smoke generated from the intensity like Solomon no one could stand to minister by reason of the cloud it's filled with smoke by reason of the intensity of the glory of God that's on the inside of you yes and the power resonating from the father's personage Thank you. and in this atmosphere no man can enter until the seven angels fulfilled their tasks now why does God make it so that no man can approach it has to do with God's covenantal relationship with the believer. Mm. If you saw this happening, what would you do? If you saw this kind of devastation coming on the earth, would you dance with glee? Oh, yeah, God, get them, mm. rip them limb from limb, no. excoriate them, skin them alive. No, Is that what you do? No, sir. It's like a <coughs> friend of mine years ago had a dream that, he uh, was standing at the gate of heaven. He was watching people be judged. And uh, the Lord came down off the throne, put him on the throne, say, now you judge. And mm -hmm. he began to cry. He said, I just have to forgive them all. Amen. Because that's what's in, it's what in our nature. And God's pleased that's in our nature. But if, that's, if you saw this happen, what would you do? You might do what Abraham did. He saw God moving in the form of three angels to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And what did he do? If there's a hundred righteous, if there's 50, if there's 10, Genesis 18, 17 through 26. Mercy. Mercy. God showed up mm -hmm. to see his covenant partner, Abraham. And he said, shall I hide from you that which I'm about to do? Well, in this case, he is hiding. Why? Mm -hmm. Because Abraham, he knew Abraham had authority as his covenant partner to negotiate uh, clemency for the, the city of so Sodom or for those that are found righteous in it. Right. And in this case, we see the reverse of that. God is hiding from us in mm -hmm. Revelation 15 what he's about to do. He's not hiding what his plan is because he does reveal it. But then in Abraham's situation, he asks and receives a measure of clemency at least where Lot was concerned. Amen. Now, what about the seven plagues? God brings a cloud of smoke and an obscuring of what is about to happen in such a way that none of his covenant partners may enter in to see uh, what's happening. He puts them in a position there. So they know something's going on, but they can't get in there to intercede because mm -hmm. there's also the altar where the coals are, where prayers are put. And when prayers are put there, they're answered because God says his default answer is yes. Amen. And amen. Mm -hmm. And so he makes it not, can't come in here. Why? Because if he let them in there, they would ask him for clemency. And this is not a time that God's clemency is going to be shown. Jesus. Do you see the power? It goes back to the power of your prayer. Mm -hmm. It goes back to what we've seen when they were all worshiping and praising. Same thing here. They were all on that sea of glass mingled with fire, praising, singing the song of Moses, the song of the mm -hmm. Lamb. And before, when they were singing this thunderous crowd, then immediately after that, there's silence in heaven because heaven's not going to do anything. And then suddenly people start praying and the engine of God's purposes mm -hmm. begins to turn. Mm -hmm. And things begin to happen time and time again. You see the prayers of the saints involved in what predicates happening next. Right. But in this case, 
Here they are again. They're singing and praising. They know they're fixing to do business with God. Mm -hmm. But before they can do it, God obscures and impedes their access to the throne of the altar of his covenant. Because he knows if they can get in there and put their prayers on the altar, it would literally do what the people in Babylon wanted to do, overthrow the plan of God. And God says, no, I, I know you would... I know you would bring mercy upon the earth, all these universalists and ultimate reconciliationists and <laughs> all these that believe there's no hell, there's all this. You need to see what's happening here. God is precluding man from getting involved because if he allowed him to approach his altar, he would be obligated by covenant to change his own plan. That's right. If you think he didn't do that, look at the first destruction. Mm -hmm. Look at the fact that at Babel, he said God repented that he made man. There are times that God has repented, but in this situation, God has sworn he will not repent. He's moving right. forward. Amen. Is that not profound? It Think about how that applies powerful, to your life. Powerful. And uh, it reminds me when Russ taught us, um, the father will not tell Jesus when he's coming back for the recovery of his saints, his bride. He won't tell Jesus because Jesus is our brother. And if you told Jesus, he'd have to tell us. He's, Jesus would tell us because we're part of his body. He's the head. And it's just the preciousness of the, the mysteries hidden in God that we accept as reality. He's covenantally bound Amen. to give us anything the Father gives him. Amen. So you see the power, Amen. the power of your covenant with God Amen. to prevail upon the sovereignty of his character. Mm -hmm. And we're having trouble believing for the rent. Come on now. Let's have another thought, shall we? Yes, we shall. Father, we thank oh, you shit. that we've been allowed to enter into and to stand oh, in a figure on that sea of glass mingled with fire. That we might sing our hearts, sing the song of Moses, and sing the song of the Lamb, and witness the culmination of your linear purposes through time that so uh, reflect as well something you're doing in microcosm in our own hearts. God, in our own hearts, there is this bundle of energy and information and outworking of your purposes that reflects everything that's in this book. Help us to understand these things, Father, and press into them. God bless you. We love you big.